This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, you know, Albert Einstein said it best, insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Well, I can tell you we are not insane here, but we have been doing this every single weekend for 53 years, and our only expectation is that you're going to like what you see. With that said, welcome to another Farm Monitor. I am Ray D'Alessio. As you can see, no Kenny this week. Nonetheless, coming up, ABAC students are really liking their new cafeteria. It includes a whole different look and new food selections. Damon Jones tells us the reason for the big changes. Also on the show, the EPA finally does away with its old Waters of the U.S. rule. But that doesn't mean the fight is over. Plus... Well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick, coming up, if you've got a young person in your life that loves tractors, but maybe has a hard time reaching the pedals of the big ones, I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman that's built equipment that go on a toy tractor, fully functional. You're not going to believe this. That and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. September 2019, an entire month dedicated to bringing awareness to a huge problem in this country right now, and that's suicide. Well, sadly, the number of farmers taking their own life continues to rise at a staggering rate. John Holcomb spoke with a behavioral health professional about why farmers are more vulnerable and what's being done to help them. According to the CDC, farming is ranked one of the worst vocations for people taking their lives. But why is that? What makes farmers so much more susceptible to suicide? And what is being done to fix this problem that is claiming the lives of those that are producing the food and fiber for our world? To help answer those questions, I recently sat down with Jennifer Dunn with the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Farmers particularly, they're entrepreneurs. They're very successful. They're used to doing things for and by themselves. Um, when you ask a farmer what they do, uh, they typically don't say, I do farming. They are farmers. That's, it's, you know, they're a part of their existence. It's part of their livelihood. and. Um, Particularly those individuals that farm, um, they are used to doing things, things that are in their control. However, there are often things out of their control, like hurricanes, commodity prices, droughts, pests, and the list goes on and on. Those are things that are outside of their control and can be really, really stressful. And so uh, as a result, you know, th that might be a little bit harder for them because they're used to being able to do things for and by themselves. And if they are needing to seek help from somebody else, that's just not something that they're used to doing because they do everything. You know, they do the books, they do the manual work, they do top to bottom. So that might make it a little more difficult. And that's where the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities comes in. We are the Behavioral Health Authority for the state. Um, we work with community service boards, um, providers, we call them our safety net providers. We have private providers, we have contracts with um, agencies that work with individuals who have behavioral health needs and developmental disability needs. A huge part of the problem in the farming community is the fact that the topic of behavioral health has almost become a taboo topic, which makes people think they shouldn't talk about it. However, Dunn and her organization is working to change that. We want to let people know that um, it's okay to reach out, that w people are available to talk, people are available to hear your story, to hear what you're going through, and to navigate you through the system so that you're not alone. In order to do that, they have things like crisis centers in different parts of the state and crisis lines you can call. But they will also go one step further and meet people where they are, literally and it's typically people that can actually relate to what someone may be feeling. We have a lot of people that have thoughts, people that are suffering, people you know that are sad, people that might need assistance and we have so we have resources so we want to connect them with the resources. We also have a lot of people with lived experience that are in a life of recovery and so those individuals typically can be very very helpful. We hire a lot of those people sometimes they go on to pursue educationally and come into our field and we hire them as you know even if they don't so that they can be kind of um, personalize the story with that person. They can relate to them in a way that somebody who has an experience can relate to them. Reporting in Thomasville for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. 
A meantime, the ag community is breathing somewhat of a sigh of relief following the recent repeal of WOTUS by the EPA. WOTUS, of course, also known as the Waters of the U.S. rule. The 2015 rule gave federal regulators control over any waterways or wetlands under the Clean Water Act. Now, yes, the EPA plans to replace the law this winter, but according to Georgia Farm Bureau National Affairs Coordinator Trip Cofield, the fight is far from over. Uh, I absolutely expect this to be challenged in court. Uh, several groups, outside groups, have already announced their plans to do it. I expect states to, to follow suit. Uh, so yeah, the process uh, is nowhere near complete at this point, uh, but it is a big win for American agriculture. I think that was the unanimous uh, response that we saw on, uh, on the 12th when the, when the repeal was issued. Uh, but the second step is they're going to have to issue a new rule, uh, a new rule that will provide clarity and long-term certainty for farmers. Uh, that process is already underway. We commented on the proposed rule a couple of months ago. Uh, we're expecting that, uh, that new rule to be finalized late this year, maybe, uh, maybe early next year. In the meantime, ABAC students looking for a proper farm-to-table dining experience won't have to look very far as the campus dining hall is now the first of the state's colleges and universities to partner with the Georgia Grown program. Damon Jones tells you how this will provide diners with both the freshest produce and an education about the state's number one industry. Meat and three, pizza, soup and salad, no matter what you're in the mood for, the ABAC dining hall can likely satisfy that craving. And after outsourcing their food services for more than two decades, the school decided to reassume control of its cafeteria last year while also partnering up with the Georgia Grown program. We've been talking with the Commissioner of Ag, and of course, you know, we've had a good relationship with the department. We know a lot about the Georgia Grown initiative. Uh, we've got lots of, uh, lots of ABAC alums that are members of the Georgia Grown program, and uh, we said this just seems like a natural fit. That means the majority of the food being served daily was grown and raised right here in the state, ensuring diners the freshest, healthiest produce possible. I mean, it's, it's bringing a better quality. You know, I mean, we're not taking frozen vegetables that might be from California or, you know, elsewhere. Um, we're, we're able to incorporate fresh ingredients and have wonderful products. Well, I mean, as a chef, you know, I'm concerned with my food quality. And if, if you're using fresh produce, your food is go going to taste better. That's a fact. I mean, it, it just is. It's going to be more nutritious, too, because it's, it's not as processed as the other stuff. While sourcing most of your food locally will improve the quality of the ingredients, it does provide some challenges for the chef. And one of the biggest is trying to set the menu throughout the year. You're used to being able to get whatever you want, whenever you want to get it. But local, you, you start by looking and seeing what's growing seasonally. Where am I going to get it at? and uh, what stuff am I going to have to put up for winter time? I mean, and then you kind of write the menu based off of, you know, how you can get as much fresh stuff in as possible. And it's, it, you know, you let, the, you let the land write your menu, I guess, I mean, so to speak. Even though providing a variety of delicious options for the customer is the main goal, it is far from the only one, as its partnership with Georgia Grown also helps benefit the ag industry on a couple of different fronts. Number one, it helps Georgia farmers. Uh, it, it provides them a, another market for the things they grow. Uh, it provides us an opportunity to, uh, to promote the program, uh, hopefully help educate students and guests who come through the dining hall that, you know, it is possible to source locally uh, from Georgia producers and, and providers and, uh, and hopefully sort of address the broader educational issue of where does your food come from. Not only can they, you know, do they get to taste it and eat it, but they can see where it's from. You know, and we're putting two and two together there, right? Because a lot of people don't know, you know, these days about it. So we get to educate them in multi-facets. It's not just in the classroom, it's also when they're eating. While this might be the first dining hall to partner up with Georgia Grown, they hope it won't be the last as ABAC strives to be a good example of just how well it can work buying locally grown food. We set a goal of 25% the first year and we exceeded it. So we're moving, moving the goal up and, and sort of our message is, if we can do it, you can do it. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up. You know, toy tractors are great, but ones that actually do farm work are even better. You're not gonna believe what you're seeing right there coming up next.
you all know I am a kid at heart, a big kid, and you all know with me having a two and a half year old little boy at home, get excited about toys like the one I'm sitting on here, a little toy tractor. But the kind of toy tractors I have at home aren't fully functional. They're battery operated, fun stuff. But I'm gonna introduce you to a guy that's done something a little bit different and built equipment to go onto a tractor, and that happens to be Carlton Hill. Carlton, good to meet you. Yes, sir, nice to meet you. Oh, man, I'm so glad that this guy's spending a little bit of time with me today. Read an article in a magazine about him and his work and building equipment for the back of these tractors and thought we need to do a Ranger Nick on this. So okay. Carlton, gotta ask you the question. How did we get to the point where all of these wonderful pieces of equipment exist now? Where did this start for you? How did you do this? It started as a kid. Okay. It started what I call carpet farming. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, just, just coming home with my toys that I collected. Okay. And farming when I wasn't big enough to get on the real deal. And, and that's pretty much where this all stemmed from is, is having Russell and him wanting to be outside and him wanting to be doing what his daddy's doing. Yeah, so. and, and Russell's <clears throat> Carlton's eight-year-old little boy who when he was a little bit younger would use the kind of things that y'all are gonna see in this segment. So you started this with blueprints. How did you build these things though first? These well, things are made out of steel. Well, right? this scraper right here started as a on a rainy day at the barn and I just had a, that piece, piece of blade there that was yeah. just a just a flat, this right here was just a flat piece of metal, and I bent it with my hand. And I said, I'm gonna kick this to John, my brother-in-law, I said, okay. we're gonna build a scraper. And he <laughs> and we designed the wheels, and, and he helped me design how, how it lets up and down. And uh, boom, we got a scraper. And it works, <laughs> and then Russell would get on this thing and actually use this right. to flatten out he, dirt. He, and, he I mean, could scrape in the, in the sand pretty good with it, but it's kind of tough on rocks. But, yeah, I bet. <laughs> But, yeah. but you've got that. We're going to show the folks at home a bush hog. We're going to show them a sprayer and a, a dump bed right. and all that. I want to talk about that next and show you some of these parts and in particular show you how they work. And Carlton's going to show some of that. This is incredible. If my son was here right now, we <laughs> wouldn't be able to get him off this stuff. So let's take a look at that stuff next. So we want to do a little demo with some of these toys. And I want to introduce you to John Zook. John, good to see you. Nice to meet you. Hey, John. So John is one of the masterminds behind this with Carlton to take us from this actual toy, this metal bush hog right here, to this. John, how did we get from this to this thing? Well, we took that one and we scaled. We had a friend of ours uh, scale it all out, and okay. then we kind of just did that to make this as realistically as possible we can. And so this guy right here, this actual little gearbox, runs a blade underneath. But just so the folks at home know it, John Carlton, this is not a, a real cutting blade. This no. is just kind of a demo. I didn't want you all thinking that Carlton's son was out really rolling over all kind of brush. <laughs> but it's the legitimate thing. Look at this on the back. All of this is actual and real working stuff. Got to ask the question here too, Carlton. This number right here, what's that mean? It is, a, it's, it's a real bush hog number, but the O2 on it's because it's two foot wide. <laughs> <laughs> the detail is incredible. Guys, I want to go over here for a second. I've been looking at this thing. This was the piece of equipment that was featured on the cover of the magazine. Unbelievable. This boom sprayer. Can I open this guy Absolutely. up? I'm going to put this out and lock this down just like this. Right here. Okay. Lock this guy down like this. Even an old carpet farmer like me can do it. We got that. All right, so I'm gonna get out of the way. Carlton, show us this thing. Show we us this thing. Work. Switch here is run by a lithium battery, a 12 volt battery, and it actually pumps water. <laughs> can you imagine his son or child out? Now that's just water, y'all. Out with some 2,4-D spraying for poison ivy or whatever. This is actually functioning, and working. Carlton. I want to wrap this thing up today by going and talking to Russell and getting some more work done with this and showing you one more piece of equipment. So let's go there next. Well, let me introduce you to Russell here. Russell is Carlton's son. Russell's eight years old, and a few years ago, he was working this stuff all the time. He still is today. Russell's got this hoe right here filling up this dump bed. Russell, if you could tell me and all the folks at home, how does doing this kind of stuff alongside your dad, what's this done for your attitude and intention for agriculture. What do you think? Mm, I just like playing with my tractors and stuff and riding with my dad. 
And you're not watching this stuff on an iPad, Russell. You're doing this for real and building these muscles up and stuff too. And that's what I'm talking about. So Russell, can you show the folks at home how that dump bed works? Give us a little demo. Let's see this thing. Look at this. And look at the tailgate. <laughs> oh man, I love it. I love it. And just imagine Russell going down the path, spreading this out, and the dust flying. And oh my gosh, I love it. And the mud flaps that say pedal power. Oh my gosh. Russell, thank you so much for showing us all this stuff, my friend. Thank you so much. And I got to thank your dad, Carl. Yes, thanks sir. so much for Absolutely. being out. Man, you're doing a good job. Thank you. And John. Thank you so much for hanging out and doing yes. all y'all have done. I, I hope that this segment inspires the folks at home. Sit those iPads down, get outside and do some stuff like this, some real work with your kids. Y'all, while you're online, maybe checking out some of the magazine articles that have featured these pieces of equipment, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page. Check out the Farm Monitor Facebook page, see what's going on there. And until next time, guys, like we always say, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. And as always, we'll see you back here next month. See ya. Nick, thanks so much. After the break, celebrating rural America a unique look at a lifestyle we've all come to love through the eyes of the Smithsonian. I'm Stan Kirk, president of Cobb County Farm Bureau, and we're out here at the Cobb County Farmers Market uh, we have this every Tuesday from 3 to 7. About five years ago, we started talking to the people at Cobb County Parks and Recreation, and they wanted to have something like this out here, a place where people could come every week to benefit the community and have fresh vegetables and fruits, and just to get people out of a community setting and promote agriculture and promote the Cobb County Parks. We have to depend on urban farmers and, and people that farm on lesser quantities of land so that they can bring out their products and have a market for them. Uh, there's really not a lot of markets out here other than things like the farmer's market so that they can come out and sell their produce. Everything we have here is locally grown. The farmer has to bring their own products. They can't resell products that they bought somewhere else. They grow it themselves. Anything that a vendor makes, crafts, anything like that, they make it themselves. So you're getting local products and you're supporting your local community. You know, the vendors love coming out because they get a chance to meet their neighbors, meet people in the community, and promote their farms. Some people don't know where the farms are in Cobb County, so our vendors are able to tell them where they are. They can get them to come out and actually visit the farm and see where their products come from. So it's good for the vendors, and they love the interaction that they have with our patrons. If you'll just come out and give it a try, you'll see that we have fresh, fresh products, jams, jellies, vegetables, fruits, honey, all kinds of fresh products, baked goods, and once you come and start buying here, you won't want to go to the store to buy it. Finally this week, from now until June, Roll America will literally be on display throughout the state of Georgia. Thanks to a partnership with the Smithsonian, Georgia Humanities is hosting Museum on Main Street a program that provides small and rural communities a platform to showcase the many wonderful qualities of rural country living. First of all, it was very competitive. This, this exhibit, the, um, the communities that apply to host this, they have to submit an application. And in this case, we had them write about their community. How, how has it changed? What do you foresee? And so it was very difficult just reading the applications. We got about 44 applications. That's a lot from all small towns, and it was very difficult. So the exhibit is wonderful. It has uh, panels that address different big themes. Um, 
towards the end, it's, it's about the community and, and how they're, they fare, but there's also a wonderful ending panel or display that has a chance for the people to participate, interact with the exhibit by writing a po on a postcard what they would do to change their community if they could to make it better. Uh, I think it says something like, if you were the mayor, what would you do? Well, that's one of the questions. So I think that's wonderful. But early on in the exhibit, um, you can turn on to radio broadcasts from the earlier days. Um, there's even information on the New Deal as well as rural electrification. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that there were two curators that put this together for content and stories. And one of them is from Georgia, Dr. Ann McCleary from the University of West Georgia. The other um, uh, doctor is Dr. Deborah Reed from um, Eastern Illinois University, but she now lives in Michigan. And together, those two worked like crazy. I know that they held conference calls at 6 a.m. every morning. It was amazing. But I know that Dr. McCleary worked on this with Dr. Reed a year and a half, maybe, or more to get the content right. And there were meetings, and there were they had outside individuals that contributed, um, would read what they had written and make comments. And some of these individuals, one of them owned a f whole a uh, farm area from the Midwest, and then they had another professor from another location. So I mean, the Smithsonian does that type of thing. They want to make sure it's right. And I think anyone that looks at this exhibit will say it's right. It, it, it hits it on the head. Living in rural America is more than a farming thing. Um, for, for many people, especially since a lot of the farms have, have sort of disappeared, and yet people still live there. This is very interesting to me that the home place might be crumbling and, and, and not fixed, and yet you'll see a real pretty house or trailer right next to it, and that's because they, they stay close to the home place. Yeah, as Arden Williams said, a lot of time and effort in order to make this exhibit happen, so go check it out. Here are the dates and locations. Monticello on that list, Somerville, then the final stop taking place April 25th through June 5th. That will be in Blue Ridge. So we certainly hope you can visit one of those locations. So unfortunately, we are out of time, but before we go, a reminder that for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm, be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.